Have you ever said to yourself, don't be so impulsive, think before you act, I should be more responsible? And I think this is something that we've all said to ourselves at one point or another in our daily lives or in, our, in the year. And one harmless example of myself doing this is that one time when I was younger in high school, I waited up until the day before an exam to start studying for that exam. And when it came time to study, I sat down and I realized I actually had two options. I could do just that, I could study. Or I could go outside and play, do whatever it is I wanted to do, and ultimately do whatever it is I did do, because I didn't study. And the result of my action was that I got an 11.9% on that exam. <laughs> yeah, by far, definitely the worst grade I've gotten so far, right? So far being the keyword. <laughs> and then on the other end, have you ever said to yourself, don't try so hard, you're overthinking it, you're going to burn out. And at work or university or in an extracurricular that you really choose to devote yourself to, I think this is a statement we come across as well. And so in my own experience, you know, keeping the same theme of academia, an example of me doing this is that I pulled several all-nighters in order to score much higher on exams. So here's my desk after an all-nighter, and I have several cups of tea right there, including a coffee pot of tea. I have my notes strewn across the table and my laptop there in case I need to look anything up. And the repercussions of this sort of an action is that the next day, I really have a reduced appetite. I hardly eat, I can't focus, and it's not uncommon that I won't sleep for another day. So like a two to three day period, I'm absolutely useless. And so why do we do this to ourselves? I mean, why do we sometimes really sell ourselves that instinctual, impulsive side within us, and, that, and then at other times really sell ourselves to try to be intelligent, to try to act through intelligence? And I think it fundamentally boils down to one thing, how we view it. We view the two in this dualistic relationship, a dualistic relationship being where the two sides are in opposition with each other. And so that relationship is what I wanted to talk to you about today. And so let's start with going through what instinct and intelligence is. Instinct is an inborn pattern of behavior, right? So for example, the giraffe, almost immediately after birth, like many other animals, it knows how to move around. And sea turtles, not only do they know how to locomote, but they also know where to go. They head straight towards the ocean without anyone seeming to really tell them to do so. So it's truly amazing that both these animals know how to do this. It's almost as if their mere existence gives them the necessary tools and implements for survival. And then on the other hand, what I think we as humans believe differentiates us the most from animals, although we are one, of course, is our acute capacity to think, to learn, and to subsequently make a decision. And it's this laborious process of study and prediction that we have really chosen to side with because, at least superficially, it seems like it really gives us a survival advantage, right? We've been able to extend our lifespan approximately 40 years since the year 1900. This is truly an amazing feat. But intelligence isn't un obtained unencumbered. It comes at a price. So what's that price for this laborious, laborious process of study and prediction for something that is really, at least in some sense, nothing but methodical mistrust? And that's anxiety. Anxiety is often coupled with intelligence within the context of the modern world. So let's delve into that a little bit deeper. Why does that happen? Well, one, because we divide the world around us into these digestible snippets of facts, information, events, and things. And it's in these comprehensible chunks that we can do our analysis and then make a prediction. But the problem with that is that there's an innumerable number of ways that we can divide the world around us. So our prediction, can we ever be entirely sure that we haven't omitted something important, that we haven't overlooked a key fact, that we haven't simply divided it incorrectly? Two, to become an excellent predictor, you have to be an excellent observer. And in order to be an excellent observer, it requires that you remove yourself from the system of study. It requires that you remove yourself from nature, from the world around you. Not only does that foster an alienated feeling, but always thinking about the future can sometimes build an emotional tie to that future event, which may or may not even occur, and simultaneously not even allow us to live in the only time frame that truly exists, the present. And third, we impose a chronologic order on the system, and of course time is a very useful construct that we all use, but by having an imposed chronologic order on it, it gives us a, an acute sense of time. Right? And how often do we find ourselves fighting time in our day-to-day -day life? There aren't enough hours in the day, there aren't enough hours in the week, the month, the year, whatever it may be. So the next question would be, how do we escape this? How do we navigate away from this like, seeming coupling of anxiety and intelligence? And there's many ways to do, to do this, but three ways to escape this issue is, one, you can side with the other end. You can embrace 
that highly glamorized, impulsive lifestyle. You can go on your shopping sprees or drive recklessly, whatever it may be for you. But of course, this overlooks the very valuable offerings of reason and will. Two, you can prescribe yourself to the should-dos of societal norms, but this kind of uncontested obedience can lead to a half-hearted and unsatisfying life. Or three, three isn't so much escaping the issue as it is resolving it, recognizing that the two are actually interdependent entities rather than mutually exclusive concepts, recognizing that instinct needs intelligence as much as intelligence needs instinct. And so this yields a much more fruitful understanding of what the two is, just like in other dualities, right? Good cannot exist without evil, and evil cannot exist without good. So at least on some level, this can be likened to Tao or yin and yang, the way and the balance of nature. And through acceptance of this and recognizing this, we can start to bridge that mind-forged gap that we have between the two. So, to wrap this up, it's important and critical that as we go about our day, we recognize the inseparability of instinct and intelligence. And not only that, I think that intelligent thought will recognize and know that intelligence is not enough, that intelligence cannot stand alone. And so I urge you, as you go about your day, even though it may be so hard to recognize when we're siding one way too heavily as opposed to the other, try and live somewhere in between, because somewhere in between is where wisdom is. And wisdom will give you the knowledge to know when to follow that instinctual gut side you have. And wisdom will also tell you when intelligent action is called for. Wisdom will allow you to avoid scoring that 11.9% on an exam or weathering yourself to your breaking point by staying up all night. It's wisdom that will allow us to dissolve the illusion between the two. It's wisdom that will allow us to leave this dualistic mind frame in favor of a far more holistic one of balance. Thank you very much. <laughs>